can try that again. Good morning. It's, it's helpful when the mic is on. Um, and Priscilla and I uh, faced a, a quandary this week after spending all of July and August uh, looking at non-canonical texts and gleaning the wisdom from ancient Jesus communities that didn't make it into the Bible. Uh, now we're back to reading uh, from the Bible, and we are confused about how to do that again. <laughs> uh, but we're going to hear from, uh, from the Gospel of Mark this morning. First, uh, a poem from the Palestinian-American poet Naomi Shihab Nye. This comes from a collection she put out in 2019 called The Tiny Journalist. I uh, weave together her own reflections of living as a Palestinian-American Ameri Palestinian and her family life with Facebook posts from a 13-year-old Palestinian journalist. Um, this one is called Separation Wall. When the milk is sour, it separates. The next time you stop speaking, ask yourself why you were born. They say they are scared of us. The nuclear bomb is scared of the cucumber. When my mother asks me to slice cucumbers, I feel like a normal person with fantastic dilemmas. Do I make rounds or sticks? Shall I trim the seeds? I asked my grandmother if there was ever a time she felt like a normal person every day, not in danger. And she thinks for as long as it takes a sun to set and says, yes, I always feel like a normal person. They just don't see me as one. We would like the babies not to find out about the failures waiting for them. I would like them to believe on the other side of the wall is a circus that just hasn't opened yet. Our friends learning how to juggle, to walk on tall poles. A poem about hoping for and maybe making a world that's better than it is. The gospel lesson is assigned for today and the lectionary comes from Mark chapter seven. The people who organized the lectionary carved it up like a turkey and took out slices, but I'm putting them all back in because uh, there was stuff that felt important to hear. So this is, this is a, a long one. It's Mark 7, uh, 1 through 22. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them which sounds like common sense to us today, right? But uh, this is a, dif a different world. This is about religious purity. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. Th this is factually not accurate. Not all of the first century Jews did these things. So the Pharisees and the scribes, who, who did those things, asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? But they eat with defiled hands. He said to them, Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. It's written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God to hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, this is the part that was cut out, but it feels important. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting God's actual commands in order to keep your tradition. Moses said, honor your parents, and whoever speaks evil of their parents must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells their parents, whatever support I might have given you is an offering to God to support the temple, then you keep people from supporting their parents and you void the word of God through the tradition that you have handed on. You do many things like this. Then he called the crowd around and said, listen to me, all of you, and understand this. There's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile them. It's the things that come out of them that defile. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples asked him about this saying, this parable. He said to them, you don't understand don't you see that whatever goes into a person from an outside can't defile them because it's entering not the heart, but the stomach, and, and then goes out into the sewer. Jesus made a poop joke. <laughs> Thus he declared all foods clean.
clean. And he said, it's what comes out of a person that defiles. For it's from within, from the human heart, that all of, these, all, all of our evil intentions come out. These evil things come from within. They're what defile a person. That's the word of God. Margaret Payne died late last month. If her name doesn't ring a bell, it's okay. The name she was known by for most of her life was Sister Mary Teresa. I'd never heard of her uh, either until I read an appreciation last week. But it always seems like a good time to uh, bring up and celebrate a badass nun and worship. Um, she seems like someone who would have been worth knowing. Sister Mary Teresa Kane was born in 1936, Depression era, to Irish immigrant parents. In 1955, she entered the Sisters of Mercy of America. After entering the order, she went to college, got a degree. Uh, then she spent a whole career in mercy ministries focusing on health care. She became the CEO of a hospital before she was 30 years old. By the time she was 40, she was not only the president of her order of nuns, but also the president of an umbrella organization that represented 90% of nuns in this country. So clearly, she was a talented, driven, gifted person. In 1979, uh, the Pope John Paul II made his first trip to this country. And in part of the celebration, part of the big event, he held a, a special convocation. With, I don't know if convocation is the right word. It's just a word I have. Uh, with, with a large group of nuns, they met at the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. Uh, and it was during this time of celebration that Sister Mary Teresa came, was, uh, was given the chance to offer some remarks. And she very calmly stood up and offered these comments to the Pope. She said, as I share this privileged moment with you, your holiness, I urge you to be mindful of the intense suffering and pain which is part of the life of many women in these United States. I call upon you to listen with compassion and to hear the call of women who comprise half of humankind. As women, we have heard the powerful messages of our church addressing the dignity and reverence of all persons as women, we have pondered upon these words. Our contemplation leads us to state that the church, in its struggle to be faithful to its call for reverence and dignity for all persons, must respond by providing the possibility of women as persons being included in all ministries of the church. And 5,000 nuns burst out into raucous applause in the face of Pope John Paul II. She had just told the Pope that in order for women to join in his mission, he needed to make a radical shift and treat them as equals. When the Vatican later on asked her to clarify her comments, they were essentially giving her a chance to say, well, I wasn't really talking about ordination. She made it clear that she was absolutely talking about ordination. Three years later, when she was already and still in hot water with the Vatican, she showed up in the Poconos to the Kirkridge Retreat, for, uh, Kirkridge Retreat and Study Center, where I think you're on the board, right, Bob? You what? Bob was on the board. Not in 1982, I don't think. But uh, she, she showed up at Kirkridge Retreat Center and gave the keynote address at the very first conference for Catholic lesbians. 1982. All of this made me wonder how much time she must have spent meditating on this Jesus story. We should be clear that the, the author of Mark's Gospel had an agenda. He, uh, he got some details wrong, as, as I already said. It's just not true that all the Jews in the first century uh, followed all of the purity rituals that he spells out. In fact, every argument that we find Jesus embroiled in, in the Gospels, was a live issue in the Judaism of the day. He was being a fully engaged Jewish person taking part in uh, deeply, uh, uh, deeply felt arguments. In this case, we're getting a look at the distinction between what, what people now call the written Torah and the oral Torah. The law as it is written and the law as it's put into practice through tradition. 
In Jesus' time, and in the decades following that, there were some Jewish people who accepted only the written part as authoritative and binding. But there were others, like the Pharisees, who said, well, wait a minute. What is written down has gaps. It doesn't cover everything. It's not always clear how to apply it in a given situation. It requires interpretation and addition and refinement. And these, the oral traditions, should also be considered authoritative. In fact, in Matthew's Gospel, we have a good example of Jesus doing exactly that. Uh, engaging in that kind of interpretation and clarification and refinement. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, uh, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then he has a whole series of statements where he quotes scripture, the written scripture, and then clarifies it or even intensifies it. You've heard that it was said, uh, um, uh, you shall not murder, straight from the, the written. Uh, but I say to you that your anger will make you liable to judgment. So a tradition built around the written. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you that you should interrupt the cycle of violence instead of perpetuating it. That's a paraphrase, but uh, it gets at the idea. The fact of the matter is that every body of law requires interpretation and clarification. Every body of law, therefore, has a tradition that is built up around it. The question is, does the tradition interpret and clarify the law in ways that help or in ways that harm? Who benefits and who doesn't? Jesus gives a powerful example of this in the section that the lectionary people wanted to leave out for the morning. The law said right there in the Ten Commandments that children should honor their parents. This is about adult children. This is a, a world uh, full of ancient people who had no concept of social security or retirement savings. Uh, their children were their retirement savings. When age and infirmity made them unable to care for themselves, it was the children's responsibility to support them and care for them, to honor them. The interpretive tradition that built up around this law, though, said that, well, we know that sometimes there are multiple and maybe even competing claims on people's resources. Yes, it is honorable and sacred to support your aging parents. It's also sacred and necessary to support the temple that is the heart of our religious life. If you dedicate your resources as a sacrifice to God, that takes precedence over everything else, including supporting your parents. Uh, it's probably good that this isn't coming up during a pledge campaign, right? <laughs> Please don't, uh, don't give the church the money you need to eat or support your parents. Who benefits when the law is interpreted through this tradition and who is harmed? That's the point that's coming up. We might think in our own context about something like the Second Amendment. The written law gives people the right to own guns. It would seem to specify that that right uh, is limited to people who are part of a well-regulated militia. But the way it's written is a little bit confusing and ambiguous. A whole body of interpretive and cultural tradition has built up around it that enshrines it as a sacred right that has almost no limits. Who benefits from that tradition? Gun manufacturers, the politicians who receive their lobbying dollars. Who's harmed by it? The more than 48,000 people each year in this country who die by gunshots, suicide victims, people attending concerts, people at nightclubs, innocent bystanders, children playing outside, children walking to school, children in school. What do you think Jesus might have had to say about this tradition? How does this tradition, how do any of our traditions show what we love and who we love? This week I, I was introduced to a prose poem of Mary Oliver that I never read before from 2009. I often consider her to be a prophet of beauty for the ways that she encourages us to slow down and pay attention to our world, particularly the natural world, and how well she demonstrates that. 
But this brief poem also shows that she uh, had in her the capacity to be a prophet of judgment. It's a short piece called Of the Empire. Of the Empire, we will be known as a culture that feared death and adored power, that tried to vanquish insecurity for the few and cared little for the penury of the many. We will be known as a culture that taught and rewarded the amassing of things, that spoke little, if at all, about the quality of life for people, other people, for dogs, for rivers. All the world in our eyes, they will say, was a commodity. And they will say that this structure was held together politically, which it was, and they will say also that our politics was no more than an apparatus to accommodate the feelings of the heart and that the heart in those days was small and hard and full of meanness. This is brilliant because it judges us, but it also offers us hope of a people in some future time who are able to look back and say what was wrong from a perspective in which clearly it wasn't so wrong and they had be become more generous and expansive and caring. Who is included and who is excluded? Who benefits and who har is harmed? Who falls through the cracks of the traditions and the way that we have always done things? These are things that Jesus invites us and challenges us to ask ourselves. They're the questions that drive change, which doesn't come easily and it doesn't come quickly. It took the United Methodist Church almost 60 years of arguing to realize that its tradition stood against the will of God by harming LGBTQ folks. The Catholic Church still doesn't ordain women, but Sister Mary Teresa stood up. Mary Oliver stood up. Naomi Shihab Nye stood up. Jesus stood up. Stood up to say that every single person is God's beloved child. And if that is your guiding principle, then you can't go wrong. This is God's good news.